You want to say something to synchronize? Yeah, sure. I mean, we we could do that. I only t- that actually would be a very good idea. I don't know why I haven't been doing that until now. <laughs> I just tend to synchronize afterwards and put by ear. Okay, three, two, one, now. now. Hello and welcome back to the Redcast, the show all about exploring the world of entertainment and the many forms it takes. I'm your host Troy, and welcome to episode five of season two, brought to you 48 hours early at www.patreon.com forward slash Renarch Live. So if you'd like to listen to the podcast episodes on Saturdays rather than Mondays and enjoy two days early access before public release, then head over to that website and pledge as little as a pound to get that early access. Today's guest is potentially one of the most anticipated episodes of the show yet, as I sit down and chat to the legendary music composer Simon Vick. We chat all about his time with Overkill Software, making music for Payday the Heist, Payday 2, playing the role of Bane in both of those games, as well as leaving Overkill, going freelance, and then signing on with Ten Chambers and working on GTFO as their lead composer. And for the first time on the Redcast, we have a huge exclusive scoop of news with regards to upcoming work from Simon for the Payday universe, so if you're interested for that, make sure you listen right the way through the podcast for something very cool towards the end of the episode. But that's enough talking from me, so let's end this intro and get right into the episode. I hope you enjoy it. So we're going to start off but the first question me being just asking you how are you doing so how are you doing tonight simon you good i'm good i'm good i'm a little bit stressed uh there's some work <laughs> to to do for for the next uh, dtfo uh update but <laughs> uh i i work pretty well under pressure so it's 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 manageable it's a good trait to have i wish i was as good with that <laughs> my usual thing is leaving things to the last minute which is not a very good trait to have on the other end of things so what if you're good at working under pressure? Then it's that that doesn't really present yeah, much true. of a problem. Like if you if you wait until the last minute because you're good at in the last minute, you know. I mean, I suppose it could be said. I do normally tend to get stuff done in the end. I think I just end up making myself a bit too stressed as a result. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So, thank you very much for coming on to the podcast. I really do appreciate you having uh, being a part of this. Uh, what I want to do starting off with you is I want to talk to you first about your origins in music. So, what got you into the world of writing music? Did it start at a very early age? How did it all begin for you? Well, <clears throat> my mother played the piano. My dad uh, didn't. He used to play uh, the saxophone and clarinet, uh, and I think the accordion, maybe even. I'm not sure. He, he didn't. He never did that when I, you know, he he had quit doing that stuff. Uh, uh, sounds like I'm talking about drugs, but um, he he quit that before <laughs> before, uh, you know, uh, I grew up. So I never saw him do that. But I'm I'm sort of grew up in a musical household, um, and my mom played the piano at home. We had a piano, and she played it a lot. So so uh, yeah. And that's where it started. Like I started playing the piano. I took, I took piano lessons for a few years, uh, and then um, I wanted a guitar f- for Christmas uh, in high school, and I got one. And I become became the uh, guitar playing, um, you know, ponytail guy for for a while. <laughs> that was my that was my <laughs> cliche that I lived in high school. I actually started making electronic music as well, not with like an agenda of doing it, like releasing the music or anything i played to my friends and my classmates and stuff like that and they told me that that was this is pretty good uh but it didn't really take off and became anything professional until a friend from high school Ulf Anderson, who we went to the same class he wanted to have some music for his uh game that he was making he and his brother were starting up uh a game development company <laughs> he actually quit high school to, to to do that full time wow uh and then i started helping them out with music uh you know i did not quit high school high school so that was uh, on like uh, uh, evenings and weekends so i often came late to school <laughs> so i was up <laughs> in the middle of the night making electronic music for for ulf uh and his uh, his game, but that's how I, I how I got started really. Wow, which game was that then? Was that one of the ones that was released via their studio? Or was it something separate? No, that was the first gr- uh, game that was re- released uh, by Grin. Uh, I mean, uh, that game wasn't done until uh, like when I was still in high school. They were just pitching to get funding, and then yeah. when they actually started making a game, uh, I had already quit high school. Uh, you know, I, I'd graduated and then uh, I was one of the first guys that they hired, you know, for the company. So I was a staff member of the development team. Uh, and then we did, um, or we made um, Ballistics, which is a futuristic racing game that was released yeah. in 2001. I didn't actually know that you knew Ulf Anderson for that long. So that's kind of, 
it's quite a cool connection you had that you've known each other for so long and that was how you know the connection began with all the different games that it it started at such a young age yeah yeah i i, I got to know Ulf when i was 16 what was it about electronic music in particular then that you know drew you to composing that kind of that genre what was it about electronic that appealed to you well uh, i mean the first sort of music that wasn't my my parents music that i really enjoyed uh, that became mine, you know, that I started listening to in my, my early teens was, was alternative rock and grunge, as it, the genre was called in the early 90s. So, so uh, my, my, you know, idols were and still are Pearl Jam and, and uh, Alice in Chains and Soundgarden. Uh, yeah. And that sort of music. But then I heard some music like when I was around 15. I heard, or 14, 15, I heard uh, The Prodigy, and they were sort of like, um, you know, crossing electronic music and, and, and some rock elements. Uh, and it was really like aggressive, and they had the drum loops and, and uh, guitars and a few tracks and stuff like that. And that really uh, became a gateway drug for me to get into electronic music. And then I started listening to um, Chemical Brothers, uh, and that mm. sort of stuff. So it wasn't like <laughs> I, I, I wanted, I wanted beats. You know, I, I liked big beat and break beat and uh, yeah, drum and bass and that sort of stuff. I listened to Ronnie's uh, Ronnie size. I mean, drum, drum and bass was huge, obviously, in the '90s in Europe, at least. Mostly British artists, but I can't remember it right now. Metalheads was a, I think that was a label, that wasn't an, an artist, but yeah, I can see, I can see the, the, the logo on the. Uh, in my mind, uh, in front of me on the on the discs, but yeah, I, yeah. So that was uh, how it started. Like that was it was pr pretty much Prodigy. Yeah, it's a good choice that Prodigy. Yeah, had some really good songs. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know them from the time, of course, because I'm. What was my first thing? I have to remember now because I, I did try composing music with in my high school, but I was nowhere near as good at it. I, I was very much kind of like. You know, I, I knew the things I needed to do to make decent pieces, and that was about it. I couldn't really do anything too inventive, but I think I was... I yeah, think well, that that was the case with me as well. Like, you, you, yeah. you should not assume that I was good when I started out. Like in Well, I mean, you can't blame me for assuming that, considering what you've got now. <laughs> no, but I was rubbish back then. Trust me. Oh, God. You're making me feel a bit better then, because, yeah, I look back at some of mine. I mean, I... I would write like a couple of little simple bits for like piano because I started learning piano when I was like seven and I'd write these little things and go up on stage in my school and play them and I, I found the books recently because I was sorting out this is a new room I moved to recently so I was going through loads of old stuff and I was looking back at all the little old manuscript books I wrote songs to and then literally just like these little tiny little progressions of chords and things I'm like it's like really get up and play this because looking at it now I'm just like oh my god but that was one thing that I did I found it enjoyable but I, I wish that I'd had a bit more skill i think what didn't help was that in my music class it was just me and another guy that took it to gcse level to the exams and he was much better at it than me i think he had more of a kind of i don't know what the word is for i suppose an aptitude i suppose and he was really good and i was sat there thinking you know i want to try and capture it to the same level as him and i didn't i didn't manage it as well but i just loved the idea of it myself as well so i always found it fascinating but it's just good i mean i'm just a huge fan of music anyway to be fair it's yeah. just such a great thing. Well, I if love you, it to bits. If, if, you're, if you start out making music yourself, you know, in the beginning, you go to sleep one evening having written something and you wake up the next morning and you listen to it. And it was awesome the night before. And now it's like, this is crap. <laughs> but, the, you know, the, the week after you make something that is still good the, 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 the morning after. Mm. But the morning after that, it's crap, you know. So then you make music that lasts for a week, and then it's crap, you know. And then you start like you start making songs, and and before you know it, you're making something that that lasts a month or half a year, or you make a lot of music, and you haven't even grown tired of the first thing you did for for that sort of project uh, yet. So you 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 realize that you you're making music that you find good. I guess it's just about honing your skills. I suppose I just need to pick it back up again because it's been, I don't even know how many years now, about six years since I last used it because I was using, what was the program called? I remembered it last time because I was talking to Gustavo for the last series and I remember to mention this and I couldn't remember the program. It begins with an S. I don't know why I've forgotten this again. Sibelius. That was what we were using at the time in there mm -hmm. and that was that was really good. Um, but I need to just, I think I need to just have another go at it again because I love it. I've been trying to pick up guitar recently because I just love I love a guitar. I've had a guitar for about four or five years and just never really tried it because I tried to learn to play it at one point 
Yeah. And I don't know what it was. I felt like I couldn't properly get my hand around the frets. It might have just been because I wasn't like good with it. But I was like trying my best to try and get around and play the chords. And I was finding like my fingers weren't stretching properly. So I just kind of went, oh, forget it. I'll try another time. And only recently just picked it up again. So it's, I think that's, you know, I'm starting to get more of a spark again with music again. I just love playing stuff. Yeah. You know, because I love, I love the piano, but there's something about the guitar. I think that's so, it sounds like I'm being like really pretentious, but it's, it's, it is so like simple yet, yet profound with the guitar. I think the, the musicality of it is gorgeous. And I just yeah. really want to try and pick it up again. But yeah, Sam, I talked about getting in with, to Grin with Ulf. So talk me next through the shift from Grin into Overkill. What was the kind of progression there from one company to the next and then leading on to Payday the Heist? Well, Grin went back bankrupt <laughs> in 2009. So there was no, no way to not do a transition, you know? Mm. We had to move on. Uh, and uh, already when we were cleaning out the office uh, of uh, Green's office, and we were like, you know, sort of preparing to, to, to shut everything down, and uh, uh, we were already talking that, like, okay, we'll, we'll start something new, you know? We'll be fewer. We'll, we'll be just be a handful of guys, but we rally up a few guys that, that, that we like, uh, and then we make something smaller. Then late 2009, already, you know, before Christmas, we were already making apps, and uh, that was what was smaller, you know. Uh, we were making some something that we thought we could handle, you know, and we could. We we made something something pretty good, uh, but we never re- released anything, and nothing became good enough to actually like, you know, you have to have a lot of like, you know, quality of life sort of, you know, the game pauses automatically when you when you lock your phone and 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 you can recall the exact position you were in when you start the phone again and stuff like that. We hadn't put that sort of stuff in there. Uh, so the game was like 70, 80%, you know, but it's a lot of work making that last, you know, 20, 30% and make it really like really shine, uh, and, and a smooth experience, you know? So we never got that far before, (laughs) I guess, grew tired of all all of that. And where he was like, ah, let's make something for real, you know, and let's, let's, let's make an actual first person shooter, you know? And then he had this idea that the elevator, elevator pitch was like, it's like left for dead, but instead of zombies, it's cops and you're robbers and you're trying to get into a bank. And that, that was the elevator pitch. And we were all like, sounds amazing. You know, why, why hasn't anyone done that? You know, it's like allies versus Nazis, uh, humans, like space Marines versus aliens. And then cops and robbers, those are like the traditional like uh, pillars of any conflict <laughs> in like science, in, in, uh, in action games or uh, movies or what have you. So, yeah, we were like, let's just make it, you know, it, it sounds it's such, a, such an easy concept to, to grasp, you know, and you got these. It's, it's easy to, to pull from popular culture, you know, movies and, and stuff uh, and real life crimes, I guess, as well. Uh, to come up with objectives, you know, uh, holding the fort by the vault door while the drill is is doing its work, you know, and stuff like that. So then we started working on that, and then we were like eight guys or something when we started out. I don't remember exactly, but it was less than ten. And then, uh, yeah, we we uh, bolstered the team with some recruits from a school in Stockholm that teaches game uh, game development. So they were like newly graduated from that school. So we were like twenty five, maybe total eight of us were senior and then more like junior people making you know the graphics and stuff the content basically and i made the sound effects and the music and cast the voice actors and directed the the voice actors and stuff like that and ulf did one voice i did bane uh because it was cheaper you know Mm. payday the highest was you know total shoestring budget sort of game you know so we were really hustling to 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 get it done and you know, get it out the door. But to us, it was a huge success because, uh, yeah, we'd made it for such a small budget. And, uh, yeah, that's how Overkill got started. That's brilliant. So, right, well, let's get down to the nitty-gritty and let's get to the, the music of it. So from your, I want to kind of explore a bit more into, like, your mind and how you've done a lot of this music. So talk me through a little bit about the creative process of actually writing music for Payday the Heist and Payday 2. Like, what goes through your mind when you're writing a track for a heist? What are like the key things for you? Well, it took a while. For, like for for Pay to the Heist, I started experimenting a lot, and I I uh, did some music where I had like uh, programmed drums that were supposed to sound like real rock drums, and I played the guitar and I made more like rock music. But I I never really liked what I could make, and then I 
made it more electronic and had more like industrial elements like distorted synthesizers and and uh drum loops but it was never like symf symphonic or or um like cinematic music the idea was always that it was uh that the game was a power fantasy and the music should enforce that you know and and, and uh, make that feeling stronger like you're you're cool you're awesome you're breaking the rules and and uh doing you know things that people imagine you know it's a sort of a fantasy you know you'd never rob a bank but you do it in your mind you know and actually one of the uh, things that had inspired Ulf <laughs> for the for the design of the game was actually a bit by dane cook who was a stand-up comedian who was really popular back then in like the late 2000 you know, around 2008, 2009, 2010. Yeah, I think I know the name. Yeah, he, he was huge and he was really funny. Uh, and he had a bit where he talked about like, girls think that guys only want one thing and it's sex, but all, they, the, real, the one thing that all guys want is to rob a bank. And then he has a bit about like, everyone wants to, everyone wants to be Robert De Niro in heat, heat and you want to stand on the desk and be like, everybody down on the ground. And, uh, and then you got a guy in a van outside is hacking, you know, uh, yeah. and, uh, and all the tropes, all the cliches, you know, and he's uh, making a huge, like a bit about that. And he ties, ties it with a nice bow at the end, uh, where it's like, a, you got a monkey in there because he's make a, he made a joke previously about a monkey. And then he sort of ties those jokes together. So the mon monkey, <laughs> he becomes the loose cannon that starts shooting. I think the, the, the hostages and stuff. I don't know. You should check it out. It's really funny. Uh, but that was like every every guy wants to rob a bank. That was like the mantra, or that was like the idea yeah. that spawned, I guess, uh, the concept of pay the heist. So yeah, the the idea to, to go back to your question was also always to make it like it's a power fantasy. The music should support that. So the music was always like very not upbeat, but you know, very like aggressive in it in a cool way like it's almost like you're 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 doing some sort of a it's a dangerous sport or something yeah that's i mean that was the idea yeah well i mean i don't have to tell you how how well you pulled it off i mean the reaction you you still get to this day no doubt tells you that what you wrote there really did resonate with people i've done videos exploring what makes payday 2 as good of a game as it is and you always get people who are constantly like the game isn't the game without the music, you know, the way that a lot of the music backs up the heist really does make the difference. And it's like you say, I mean, if, if there, it is kind of like a bit of a power fantasy of, you know, wanting to, to rob a bank and, and feel the rush of it. But, you know, whenever you do things like that, you act things out in your head, you're always thinking about like a cool soundtrack behind you. So to actually actualize that and make it a real thing, no doubt was not an easy thing, but definitely worked. Yeah, um, yeah. I assume it, it it did work because I <laughs> I hear from people all the time that they they enjoy the music, you know, and, and even outside the game. And one of the reasons I believe that is is because I never really cared about making the music subtle. Uh, mm. You don't need to 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 be in the situation that the game puts you in. The music is very aggressive in your in your face, and that's what works like as as music that you listen to when you're driving your car or working out at the gym or whatever. You know, if it was more subtle, which it could be, you know, because in the game you're already in the in the situation, and and you would need much more than some some sort of a pulse, you know, to get the stress up. You yeah. know, that would be enough, uh, because yeah, you're in the situation, and you know, uh, you see the hostages, and you see the cops, and you know that if they shoot you, you die, and you're in that, you know, there's sort of life and death situation in the game. Uh, so the music could be more subtle, but I I opted not to go, go that way and just make music that it's like my idea was like i'm not making it subtle if people don't like it they can turn it down you know that was my philosophy yeah, true but i think you need to have it to be aggressive enough to match the aggression of just how many police officers there always were at any one point during a heist it's not like you've got a couple of people shooting at you like a, a hostage situation you've literally got a swarm of people like the music i think complements that and goes really well with that yeah yeah, well, if you were if you were scoring, if it was a movie, you'd never score it with that sort of a music all the way through. You know, no, it's, no, it, you it, wouldn't. It's too intense, and it's it's fi the music is fighting for attention, you know, uh, and it's it's like taking up room in the audio space. There's limited audio space, you know, in terms of like frequencies and stuff like that, and it's ag so aggressive that it could be confused with like bullets or. You know the footsteps of yeah. the enemies or whatever. So so uh, it it's it's not clever <laughs> to 
to go that way really <laughs> uh but we just i just went for it you know yeah risk worth taking then well this could be a difficult question to ask and i, I knew it when i wrote it down on the topics to send to you because it's like it's kind of like a how do you choose between your children scenario but you've done so many different pieces across both for the payday games are there any in particular that stand out to you for any reason or another uh well there there are a few hmm <laughs> I did kind of expect this response with how many you've done. I was like, is this a wise question to ask? I don't know. You're, you're going to have to edit this down. This Because I'm going to sit here quietly for like two minutes. I might not now you've said that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I get asked this constantly and I just, I'm always, my answer always changes. You know, I'm constantly debating between different songs. I think for me personally, I don't know if it helps at all. The ones that stand out to me, I could say Home Invasion 2016 was one I think that particularly stood out to me with the Wolfpack stuff. That was fantastic. I love that remix. Um, I'm surfing the uh, payday.fandom.com <laughs> wiki right now. <laughs> Let me just remind myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, there was that. There was 8 Bits of Scary was one in particular. I'm not sure why the 8-bit version stood out to me so much, but like one of the things I used to do with my older videos was that I would always, whenever I, whenever I would do a news video or anything, I would always have some kind of payday soundtrack backing it up. And for some reason, 8 Bits of Scary was just constantly stuck out to me for a good background song to the point where I ended up getting comments after about a month or two being like, you really like 8 Bits of Scary, don't you? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's just constantly stuck in my head. Yeah, I didn't, everything I didn't make that one though. It was what, sorry? I didn't make 8 Bits of Scary. Oh, didn't you? No, that was uh, Carl. Oh God, I've embarrassed myself. Oh dear. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> It's cool. He's he's I think, he's I think very I'll cut that apt. one out. Too. <laughs> he's very apt no, at no. making making this mm. the music in the right style. I th I think he uh uh what's the word? Em emul it, emulated emulated the, yeah. the style very well. So it's I mean, yeah, he made Death Row, Steel Wrapped Gift was Carl, Bullet Rain was Carl. Left in the cold was Carl. And then Gustavo started making music. I think though if I was to pick one for you, the one I would pick out in any question would be Break the Rules. <laughs> I think that one just uh, it's probably a really really like basic answer you know there's probably some from the very early days of the game like Razor Man and stuff that you probably get a lot but like for me Break the Rules was just like the epitome of, of everything you said earlier about you know about the aggression and building up and having the, the kind of the chaos the music to match the game and there was nothing, I don't know why, but there was nothing more thrilling to me than picking that song. And every time an assault started being like, am I going to get the lyrics this time? Is it going to be the instrument? Is it going to be the lyrics? And whenever the lyrics came on, you just kind of felt this rush of like, yeah, we got lyrics, let's go for it. I don't know what it was about that that was so cool, but I, really, I just, that, that track was amazing. Uh, just to pick one from, from, from the lot here, uh, and now we wait, I think it's really oh, good. Yeah. I mean, it's not really like the typical payday, track but i like the the drums are processed in such a way you know it doesn't sound like real drums it's like really like like really sound designy and then there's that bass line that i play i played yeah. the bass myself but i sort of i can't play that all the way through you know i sort of anything that was repeating i played it once and then i just repeated <laughs> it in the in the software instead you know so it's yeah it's, it's all cheating but uh yeah if it works, I, I, wrote, it works. I, I mean, I wrote the bass line at least uh, <laughs> and played it at least once. Every every bit of it, I played it once, you know. So, um, but that was a cool track, I think. Mm, that was a fantastic one, and it was the first, I suppose, real like entirely, well, almost entirely like stealth bass track. You know, there was it was a bit of a, a different. It was yeah, kind of vibe almost. And the gauntlet, it, it was really good. I, I like. Yeah. Oh. And I think that, that one appeared in uh, in that. Uh, live action Hoxton Breakout Ho Hoxton yeah. Breakout for the first time and then I turned it mm. into a more like a fully fledged track for the game later on but those two tracks are oh, really right. I, I really like so you wrote that two. for the, the trailer first then like yeah that was a separate wow okay if I, if I recall correctly I think that was the way it went down yeah either way yeah I mean even just you should mention those has got me thinking again it's just the, 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 you did so many I don't know how you managed it the amount of different tra tracks you wrote for the game it's honestly fantastic so many yeah no, a lot of like micro sites and little trailers and stuff you know little yeah, tracks that two. we put on the b-side uh b-sides uh soundtrack all in all it has to be like a hundred songs at least yeah easily easily yeah even though i forgot about the micro sites as well i mean hoxton's housewarming party that one just that was something that once you heard it that was an earworm <laughs> you would have that one bit of it just looping in your ear constantly. which one was that um the why has it just disappeared from my brain? I had it playing in my head when I said that. Um, the one that goes, and then loops again. I don't recall that one. Oh, God. I made too many. 
it might just be that my my uh, recreation of it was really bad so we'll just say it was that yeah, I'm, i've made too but many yeah, songs I, oh. I can't remember all the riffs whenever i'm making music i try to make them the, the uh, any given track revolve around strong like short memorable hooks and, and riffs which has made it a huge challenge for me to make the music for gtfo because it's not supposed to be like that it's supposed to be much more cinematic much more subtle and uh not feel like loops and not feel like electronic music and not feel like it's a like repeating riff of any kind it's supposed to be horror music and it's supposed to be like never 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 the same any any you know it's supposed to be unsettling in in the in a way that it's where it's almost, almost like, um, you know, it's not enjoyable to listen to. It shouldn't yeah. have repeating things. You, you shouldn't be able to bob your head to the music and dig it, you know. It's supposed to be like, you know, non-rhythmical and non-melodic and like super just, you know, an assault on the... <laughs> On yeah, your make ears, you feel uneasy. You know? Yeah, exactly. And then you can't have riffs, you can't have hooks, you can't have that sort of stuff, you know. And that that has been a huge challenge for me. It was much harder than I thought it would be to make horror music, coming from the type of music that I'm used to making. Mm. Well, the next thing I want to discuss a little bit then with you. Um, you mentioned a little bit about how you ended up uh, taking on the role of Bane, but with how iconic a character Bane became, what was your kind of like? Well, what was it like evolving that character over the the course of of time that you're with Overkill because Bane became a pretty leading part of the game despite just being the guy that talks you through everything. Well, I, I never wrote the the script, so I didn't really evolve the character. I just, I just okay, so this is the mission, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, but I do remember, I do, I do remember uh, the Hotline Miami uh, heist was the first one where I read the script and I was like, it sounds like Bane is really like getting excited or really like, not emotional but it 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 feels like he's really let's go back the idea with bane is that the <laughs> the, the the robbers they're screaming and shouting and they're like get the walk out on the ground you know they're yeah. really loud because they're in the in the you know in the center of the action but mm. bane is somewhere else and he's like calm and he's just giving them the instructions because he's not in danger of getting shot he's off site you know he's somewhere yeah. else so that's that's the character sort of he's like very composed and he's just giving them the instructions and uh, they can rely on him and and you can hear it in his voice he has this confidence he just tells it as it is and he doesn't get emotional but for that uh i think it's the second uh of the two hotline miami heists where you're supposed to get into a building and they're Mm -hmm. like burning money or something and you got to get there in time before they burn all of it or i I can't recall exactly what the scenario is but it's something where bane is like you you need to get in there you know it's it's and he's like stressing out that's the first that was the first that was really like not a big thing but i i I remember that as a like this is something i've never done before uh (laughs) and because i'm not a a voice actor you know it just so happens that as i said like paid the heist was a shoestring budget production and i was the one on the team that had the least swedish accent so it made sense that i did it you know uh, one of the characters, and and the character didn't require a lot of acting. Like it, it doesn't require a range. Uh, yeah, he basically just stating what's happening, and that's about it. Yeah, he's very matter of factly in all his delivery. But yeah, that was the first one where that was the first heist where that sort of wasn't true anymore. But uh, yeah, as I said, I never wrote the scripts. Uh, the, the that was all governed by the level design, you know uh what needs to be done you know what's the scenario of the heist and then at some point you know there started to become sort of an overarching uh story of some sort uh but i never really noticed that because it was all like conveyed in the heists and i just yeah i just read it you know the the way it was written in the script basically Mm. and no one ever no one ever directed me you know because i was the one who who came up with Bane, pretty much, or the, the voice and, and, and his, his the character. Uh, so I always just read, you know, I, I might have asked for, for like suggestions or, or direction every once in a while when I didn't really exactly know what the context was. But, you know, it's, it wasn't like I played the scenarios or played the maps to, to get it. I just asked the level designers and then I recorded put the distortion on, cut it up, and then sent it, sent it to the level designers to trigger in the right point, at the right points throughout the scenario. 
basically. So oh, I wasn't, okay. I'm, I'm, I was never like in on like whether the character was changing or the, if there was some sort of an overarching uh, whatever story or grand sort of thing happening over the course of several heists or DLCs. Uh, I was just, I don't know, just delivering on, on, on the, the voice lines and never really noticed or took notice of that. Yeah, that's fair. Um, well, when it came then, uh, on the other end of the, of the story, to when you were doing your last lines as being, what was that like for you to give up that character after having <laughs> played him for however many years it was at that point? Because I remember you uploaded that video on your channel uh, of, of you preparing for the last recording, and it's just you just sat there very solemnly just over a period of like a minute or so. So what was, like, <laughs> around that whole point, what was it like giving up Bane, moving on from him? It, it, I mean, it was bittersweet in a way, uh, but... I mean, I'd done it for such a long time. I n never really enjoyed it. Like, as I said, it was a more of a production, you know, cost <laughs> sort of element to the fact that I was cast more than me l wanting to do it or, or being really apt, uh, you know, f for, for the job. Uh, and especially since I, I started directing professional actual voice actors who really could like t to take a, a piece of text or a, you know the, the lines from a script and really bring it to life i was like sit sitting there when, when i was directing them i was like this, this they're so good you know this is so yeah wow it's really like a character now uh i'm not this you know this is i can't do this so then when i was informed that this would be the last you know and when i understood that this is the last of the Bane recordings I'm gonna do, then I was like, it was a little bit bittersweet, but I can't deny that I felt a little relieved <laughs> as well. Because, <laughs> I mean, it was hard hard work. I, I, I never knew when I invented the, the voice, because it's sort of straining my my uh, vocal cords when I'm doing it, you know? I have to get, get up and pitch, and I, I, I make my voice a little bit more. This is where, this is my normal voice. But th then I go up like this, and that's Bane. You know, the thermal yeah, drill. Too much more of that. I'll ask you to tell me to get me the thermal drill. <laughs> the thermal drill, go get it. You know, that's that's where. There we go. He said the line. That's it. We're done. We've got all we needed. We've got all we needed. We can end it there. No. <laughs> um, um, so uh, I was just, I, I added a little bit more like a horse. Uh, yeah. Uh, hoarseness t t t to the voice, I guess. The idea was that the distortion would like sort of hook into the texture, that horse mm. texture in a nice way. And then his voice would cut through even better than my normal voice would do, you know. So that was like the idea behind like bringing him up a little bit in pitch, but that also made it like really hard to do it for extended <laughs> periods of time, and especially like emoting in any way, like screaming in that voice is impossible for me because I can't yeah. like I can't go there, start talking, and then take it from talking to to, to somewhere else, like being in you know panicked or performing a death scream or or being upset it's it's really tough and then um the last i think three years i did it as a i did the voice as a freelancer you know for for mm. uh, starbreeze uh and then i always delivered you know without any mistakes you know and i make a lot of mistakes when i record but i i had to go in and, and edit out and remove all the mistakes and just give them the clean lines where where the uh, pronunciation was the correct and the, the pacing yeah. and the cadence was was right. And then I noticed when I was sitting there editing it that I was like putting my, when I was listening to my own voice through the speakers or my headphones, when I heard my own voice speaking there, I put my, without thinking about it, I was sitting there silent, but I was putting my voice box into that position or that that sort of ah, the bane yeah. mode you know so it was like straining my my vocal cords even when i was sitting there in silence so when i whenever i was done and exported the you know all the voice lines as you know per per the de delivery instructions and sent them over i was like oh it's so good to have to be done with that because it was yeah so, keep your feet up and relax yeah so so again uh, you know re recording the last that for the last time was I mean, it was it, it wasn't all bad. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't blame you on that. I can't blame you. You know, a bit of a, a mixed emotions thing. Well, as you mentioned about going freelance the last couple of years, that was something else I wanted to explore with you because obviously, you know, you were with Overkill for uh, how how many years it was in the end? Because when was Overkill formed? About two thousand nine. So you were about six, seven years, was it? I think in the end. You were yeah, Overkill? six years almost yeah. to the to the month. 
I, I believe,、mm. yeah. October probably 2009 to October 2015 or September 2015.、Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember、yeah. exactly, but yeah. But then you announced that you were obviously separating from Overkill, you were going to become freelance. So, what was your decision behind that? What, was, what made you think, right, okay, now is the time to kind of go a bit more alone and try and do my own thing? <laughs> Well, Ulf had already quit the company、yeah. at that point. And、uh, he had started、uh, Ten Chambers. And、uh, <laughs> he, he had a non、uh, non-compete clause in his contract with, with Starbreeze. So he couldn't recruit me directly <laughs> from Starbreeze.、Oh. So I had to do something else in between. I couldn't go directly from Starbreeze to, to Ten Chambers. Ah,、uh, okay. So, you had to like, be freelance for a period of time before you could come on with them properly? Yeah, and, I, and I, was, I was a freelance for way longer than I actually needed to in order to just make that like, legally、uh, make that all you know, like a clean transition. I was a f- full time freelance for a good like, 18 months, and I could have been a freelance for well, like, one month just to, to have it you know, t- to, to go around. The- I don't think that this is news to anyone working at Starbreeze. They, they knew I was. What I was doing, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, it's fair enough. I mean, as you said, you know, if you started off with, with Grim with Ulf and then met Morph into Overkill and then, you know, everything evolved from there, if Ulf's going to leave, that's obviously going to be like, you know, if he's gone, you're kind of like, you know, you want to stick with him, right? You've been friends for so long. It, it stands to reason that often anyone would blame you for that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes, that makes complete sense.、Um, well, was there any particular reason in the end that you did stay freelance for so long? Was there something about it that. Drew to you that was interesting, you just kind of being a bit separate from companies, or was it just a happy accident? I, well, I, I enjoyed it and I, I had some good clients. You know, Starbreeze was a really good client.、Uh, I made a lot of music as a freelance for, for Payday 2、uh, yeah. and, the, and the voice of Bane, and they were the, the best、uh, client ever because they never, not only because of this, I, I mean, I like the people there、uh, and the people that I. Delivered to and, th- and that gave me the instructions and stuff like that. So I, I didn't mind you know, being in contact with my old colleagues there. But it was also the fact that I invented Bane, so they could never complain about my delivery. you know? Now, this is not how Bane、mm. would have said it. you know? <laughs> yeah. So it was really in,、uh, like, uh, easy for me to record Bane, you know? not, not from a like, voice standpoint, obviously, you know, regarding what I talked to before about the, my. My vocal cords. <laughs> so it wasn't、yeah. easy for the vocal cords, but it was easy from like a direction, like a creative、mm. sort of、uh, standpoint.、Uh, and the same with the music. I came up, I was the one who, who, who invented this, this, the sound, the style of music that we did for, not invented the style, you know what I'm saying? I, I was the one. No, no, yeah, yeah. I, I was the one who, obviously, it's like pulling from, from the Prodigy and it's pulling from Chemical Brothers and it's pulling from Hyper and. And all you know, drum and bass and, and a lot of stuff. So it's, it's all,、uh, what's the word, derivative,、uh, mm. obviously,、uh, in terms of style. But I was the one who like, cooked it all up and, and decided that this is the sound of, of Payday 2. So it was the same for the music that I delivered to them as a freelancer. Like, they never had any complaints, like, this doesn't sound like Payday 2. You know? No one had the mandate to. to, to To say that to me because that was. I don't t h e y needed to anyway, yeah. Even,、well. even though I wasn't, I wasn't working at, in the company anymore, they, they,、mm. they couldn't really. They had no reason to, I, I don't believe. I don't think they ever felt like we should give him feedback, but we can't because he's Simon, you know. I don't think that that ever happened. I think I made music that was, you know, very payday, like the same way I would have done if I was still at the company. But that. What I'm saying is that made my, my job as a, as a freelancer super easy. Yeah. So, so、uh, they were lovely clients, and then I, I made the music for a, a little platform game called、uh, Robonauts. And I'm super happy with that soundtrack. Like, super like, hooky melodies and very like,、uh, upbeat and blip blop, like retro video game sort of music style, but very, with much more aggressive, like, Production, like the, the distorted synthesizers. And, and、uh, so it's a little bit of like the idea behind payday, the payday music, but much less of rock and much more like old school, like Mega Man music or sort of cutesy in a way.、Uh, yeah. Like retro sounding, but, but very well produced with like heavy bass lines and like hard hitting drums and, and so on. So I'm, I'm super happy with that soundtrack. And then there's this little puzzle game called Pan Pan that I did while I was a freelancer as well. 
Uh, oh yeah, I've heard of that. And I that turned out really well with like super ambient, uh, cozy, cutesy music uh, that went really well with with the uh, with uh, with that's the the graphic style of that game. And I made the sound design for that game as well. Uh, that was published by Might and Delight, which which consists of of people, or at least used to mostly consist of people who worked on uh, Bionic Commander Rearmed within Grin. It was like a team in, within the team. Um, so those are all old colleagues as well. Oh, that's cool. Kind of like a full circle type thing. That's nice. Yeah. So I, I did a few jobs, gigs as a freelance for like 18 months. And then there was the fact, you, you, you asked me why I didn't, why, why I was a freelancer for, 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 for so long. And it was probably partly because I liked it so much and I had, you know, good clients and, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, and it paid well. I wasn't really needed at Ten Chambers, you know, at that early. At least not for making music and, and sound effects. You know, yeah. GTFO was in pre-production. You know, it was just you know sort of bouncing around ideas for what the game was supposed to be. And I had some meetings with Ulf, uh, and we were talking about you know concepts of the game world and sort of having it take pl- take place in an underground complex, just to not have to do like because we were a small team again we were back to like we had to be clever about the design like we were needed to be for 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 pay to the heist uh pay to the heist was a lot of like m- most of the maps except for heat street were, were all like folded on top of itself so that you went back and forth through the same rooms and the same corridors a couple of times so that we reused a lot of content that was w- what made that works sort of we could we couldn't compete with call of duty you know where every map every single yeah. player campaign sort of map is is this roller coaster ride where it's like oh first you start in the elevator and then you go outside and 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 you're in the in the uh, airport you know and then you go through the airport this it's it's like a not a trade of breadcrumbs but it's like this path you're yeah, supposed to go you know, and right then you come out path, yeah. yeah you come out and then you're on the tarmac and then that's you know and then they introduce these mo- uh, monsters I'm, <laughs> I'm in GTFO mode right Ooh. now but these, <laughs> they introduce these enemies uh, and so on and so forth like th- it's like this this roller coaster you can't really go off the track but you're on this track and it's 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 the game is throwing new stuff at you all the time and it's you know voice voice lines and it's like um, performance capture things happening around you and it's like super mm. you know a helicopter flying above and a missile hitting it and it's crashes into a building in front of you and it's like exciting you know all the time mm. and we couldn't really do that uh, we couldn't create that much content with with our small team so we had to like make small maps where you run back and forth and that's why you know you're in the bank and you're supposed to run back and forth to look for the password and then you're in the full vault and then you go out again and move through the same rooms you know, several times. If you play that game, or if you play the the the, the pay to the highest maps in Payday Two, you'll notice how they're all like, except for Heat Street, they're all pretty much folded, like clever, yeah, cleverly I didn't quite designed. Yeah, realized that quite as much until you pointed that out. And now, yeah, I, yeah, I do see what you mean. You know, you know the um, when you go to the gang and you're supposed to like hand them. Panic room. That's pa- the one I was thinking of as well. It's yeah. all in one building. All takes place in one building. So that that's very mm. much the payday like sort of concept. Uh, and the reason is because we, we we had to make something that we could handle with a small team. You know, we couldn't make too much content. And that's uh, that's that was the idea for for uh, GTFO as well. Like we had to. I'm going uh, on a uh, tangent here, but I was starting to talk about like. <laughs> Four minutes ago, I talked about how <laughs> I was having meetings with Ulf. And then we were like, we have to make something that we can make with a small team. And it's easier yeah. to make something where it's indoors always because then you don't have to have uh, LOD stages. Uh, LOD is, uh, stands for, LOD stands for level of detail. So when you're okay. f- standing far away from a character or a, or a prop or whatever it is in the, in the game world, there needs to be like a low poly version that is shown and then you, as you get closer you replace yeah. that one with a higher poly version and then when you're super close then you know all the the, the textures and everything are replaced to make it super detailed but it can't mm. be that detailed when it's far away because then you can render all that it'll, yeah. it'll, be, it'll be so many objects then that, that are high poly that uh, your graf- graphics card can't handle that many polygons at one, on any one time you know that was one of the reasons mm. why we wanted to make it like indoors because then it's uh, easy to like have doors and and, and uh, corridors, you know, 
uh, and rooms, you, it makes it the layout in, in, naturally. You you can't see that far. Yeah, so everything's only low, low poly until you're right next to it when you can see it, and then it all is high poly. And the things you've moved on from have already come and gone, so it doesn't have to load too much at the same time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's easier to 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 handle all the production of the the props because that you don't have to be have like super low poly version, medium poly version, high poly version, and then super high poly version or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and then, obviously, we wanted to make a hardcore cooperative game, so we wanted to have a, an atmosphere that sort of inspired play, the players to move as a group, uh, mm. not because the game instructed you to, but because the atmosphere in, in itself sort of inspires you to do that. And horror, a horror atmosphere sort of inspires you. Want to, you don't want to run off your, on your own if, if, the, if the atmosphere is super, is super creepy. So that's where the, the idea of making it a horror game came from. It d- didn't have to be a horror game. We just wanted to make a hardcore cooperative game that really put, uh, you know, cooperative first-person shooter players to the test. But yeah, when we started bouncing around ideas, uh, it became pretty clear that, you know, it, a horror atmosphere would be the right way to go. And then, uh, you know, indoors environments is sort of creepy because they're claustrophobic and it's easier to be like walking around and, and they're like, what's what's behind the next corner, you know? Uh, yeah, uh, there can be like you know little openings, and it's 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 an easier sort of environment to 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 create opportunities to to scare people, I guess. Yeah, I was saying to you before this that I haven't played the game yet, and I do really need to. I've been intending to, but I love the way it's marketed, where it's like it is meant to be a really challenging shooter. But to me, that was almost like I was like, oh my god, maybe I'm not good enough to play this. Maybe I shouldn't even try. <laughs> but because um, does it does it have control support? I can't remember. I don't think it did originally. If it does now, it was released in early access on December 9th, two thousand nineteen, and I think within two weeks we we put partial um, gamepad support in the game. Oh, there you go. I've got no excuse then. So, you, so you can <laughs> you, you have to use the mouse uh, to navigate in the main menu to choose you know your loadout and and start the game sort of. Oh, that's fair. Yeah. But then in the game, you can you can aim and move and shoot and jump and you know switch weapons and stuff like that. You can you can you can do all that stuff uh, w- w- with a gamepad. And then the only time in the actual game where you need to use a keyboard is when you interact with these terminals where you need to p- put in keyboard commands that almost sounds better to be fair where there is a bit of like a bit of both because the thing with me is i mean i get i get roasted for it constantly by my live stream chat and my community and stuff but it's just i grew up playing on consoles so i've obviously had all the brunt of the payday 2 issues they've had there and partially is accredited to how i've ended up getting to the point i'm at but you know i'm so used to playing with consoles and so when i transitioned to like trying out pc stuff it didn't i was not very good with the mouse and keyboard so i just stuck with controller so i've gotten so used to playing in that style now <laughs> that when i did i did play pay the heist once on stream last year um for the game's birthday and i was just it it was not a good time simon i was not very good you were playing on pc <laughs> yeah okay so well i don't uh, think you get any aim assist on the pc no you don't i, I, I mean on, I a, pro- was, on a proper yeah that, that didn't help on a proper console version there's aim assist you know you, you, the, the 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 lock the the aim sort of snaps to the enemies mm. a little bit, you know, sort of helping you because it's so hard to compensate when you're moving, and the target is moving, and you need to to stay with your yeah with your aim right on the head of the enemy because you want to make a headshot. You know, that's super hard to do. You know, you can do that with a mouse and keyboard much more yeah, easily. Yeah, so, so you 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 know a proper console version of any any first person shooter game has to have a little bit of that snapping not 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 so that you notice it but it, there's a s- little bit of magnetism to the targets okay well i'll ask you one more question about that game then for my own personal knowledge if i was to go into it solo how screwed would i be a gtfo yeah <laughs> I, well i imagine i know the answer to this <laughs> well no no it's not designed to be played alone you know it it, it mm. is uh to its core of a, uh, a cooperative game. So the, the the difficulty doesn't scale if, if you're fewer players. So you'll get your ass handed Ooh. to you for sure. So that'll be good entertainment. Cool. All right. Noted. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've been meaning to pick it up, but now I've definitely got the everything I need to know about. It. I can pick it up. It'll be, it'll be a good time because I've, I've followed it for a while. I've been really interested in it, but 
haven't bitten the bullet, so I, I will. I will make sure I do that. I, I'd say, like, if 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 you find horror games scary, it's really not. You know, it's it's not like Soma or Resident Evil. You know, mm. it's not scripted. Like, it's not jump scares waiting around the next corner. It's all emergent scariness, sort of. Yeah, yeah the music like is. And, and yeah, it's like, a lot yeah, more about next. tension and like the random placement of the enemies and like, oh, there was an enemy in the corner. But the next time you play that same map, there might not be an enemy at that place. It's sort of the game being lucky, you know, at placing a monster mm. in a corner. It's not designed to be clever about trying you know, like trying to hide monsters where you can't see them. It's all the, like completely random. And then it's just a matter of like designing the monsters so that they look hideous. You know, the music being super creepy and then giving you that feeling of being outgunned or outnumbered you know mm. you know the monsters are are t- take can take a lot of bu- bullets you don't have a lot of bullets so you really need to count your bullets and and you really need to communicate and, and coordinate your movements and like use everything in, you possibly can in your advantage because it's so hard to survive it has that sort of uh sur- survival horror a- element to it where you're really like <laughs> does anyone have any health you know Oh, don't give me health because I'm like at, uh, a health pack gives you twenty percent. I'm I'm at eighty one percent, and if you give me health, Ooh. it will lose that one percent. You know, you'll give me nineteen percent, and I get to to, to get from eighty one percent to a hundred. But you don't you you want to lose a little bit of health so that the health pack yes actually get all the twenty percent from the health pack. You know, so like it's very much about this. yeah. <laughs> it, you really need to think about your you know. It's a lot about anticipating where there will be a fight, you know, okay, this is a room where we can't avoid the fight. Let's prep, you know, and then you actually take some time just moving around, you know, setting up trip mines and sentry guns and, and sort of closing doors to, to funnel the monsters in the in the right direction. It becomes almost a little bit like a tower defense sort of situation yeah. where you're setting things up and then the monsters are coming. And if you've tipped everything you possibly can in your favor, then you have a much greater chance of, of surviving always having like a, an exit strategy you go into a room with the intention of sneaking or killing the monsters one by one as they're sleeping but if you you know don't manage to kill one quickly enough it al- wakes up and alerts other monsters and then it's like a domino effect and then suddenly you got like 12 monsters running at you and then it's good to have a plan b you know so you fall back through the, through the same door through which you came and then you've already set up maybe a sentry gun in the other room waiting and and trip mines in the doorway and stuff like that but if you manage to kill all those monsters while they're sleeping then it's like cool then we go back and pick up the sentry gun and and you pick up the the trip mines and everything because you didn't need plan b you know there's a lot about like uh what's the word you know pre-planning i guess uh, pre-planning and and like being threat awareness you know threat awareness constant Mm. threat awareness and 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 maintaining you know having having a, a fallback strategy always you know then yeah. then you can get through it but but if you play like absent-mindedly and you're like walking around looking around talking to your teammates about you know uh what's a good barbecue recipe you know then it's <laughs> it, it's you're gonna die you know it's a game that requires a, your full attention and that's by I'm design definitely gonna give it a go then yeah you yeah, have to you have to whilst, no, yeah i will do and i will i will tell you i will tell you when i do <laughs> so you can watch me in scream in terror <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll signal boost it for sure if you if you tweet about it i'll, I'll retweet it for sure sounds good well, i'll check it out at some point soon i definitely will do um well, there's one other thing I would like to talk to you about then before we, we wrap up towards the end, which is um, some of your other work beyond with, obviously, with Payday, with GTFO, with everything else. When I was doing a bit of extra background research, uh, I found out that you signed on with BMG back in 2016, and since then you've released several albums. So I wanted to give you a bit of chance to talk about some of that work you've done there, aside from writing music for games. Yeah, that was that was, <laughs> that was funny. I was uh, sitting at my parents' house uh, eating dinner, you know, in the week between like Christmas and New Year's back in 2016, maybe Christmas, mm. 2016. I don't remember. And I got a notification on my phone. Like someone at BMG wanted to sign me like out of the wow. blue, like, Hey, are you making music? Would you be interested in, in maybe working with us, you know, uh, as a songwriter? I was super flattered, you know, because BMG is a huge uh, publisher or whatever. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. Um, but it t- turned out that the this was the boss of the Scandinavian branch of BMG that contacted mm. me personally, which was super flattering. It turned out he has a son, <laughs> it was probably a teenager, who played 
pay to the uh, payday too. And he was like, oh wow. He, he told his dad, <laughs> you need to check out this Simon. <laughs> he can write anything. You know, he's making like fifties, you know, fifties pop music, and he's making like electronic music, and he's making, you know, eighties hits and whatnot. I don't know. So, uh, so they signed me with a contract for like I think two years or maybe three years, and I paid easily a thousand pounds in order to to have a, a lawyer you know check everything and and, and then sort of um, negotiate the wording of the contract so that i could c keep making game music without bmg owning that music you know because they wow. wanted to write a contract that was like we own any, everything you that you make you know but they they will publish it and and will share you know because i'm I, I, if i wrote the music then obviously i have to earn the percentage of the music that i they uh, that i yeah. have the rights to as a as, as the songwriter but i said that i'm i'm freelancing and i need to make a hundred percent and can't have bmg own any of the music i'm making for games so we put that wording in the uh, in the contract and that was uh, not cheap and then i ended up not making anything with with bmg <laughs> oh god oh. so two or three years i don't know remember exactly how long the contract went on and i'm getting emails every like uh six months i think which with the, some sort of an automated system for BMG, uh, you know, uh, staff or writers. Mm. And it says like, here's your, you know, what your, uh, all your BMG music has, has earned in terms of royalties and stuff oh, in no. the past six months. <laughs> it's always like 0. 0.00. 0. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I never made anything with that. And uh, never wrote a, a pop song for, for any artist or a, a, made anything like co-writes, you know, I was looking forward to doing that stuff. But the fact is, uh, I, ca I can't really compete. It, it's, a, it's a tough business to get into. Uh, mm. You know, uh, Sweden has a lot of talented songwriters and it's something I think that a lot of people as aspire to because we have so many Swedes to look up to, you know, Max Martin and, and a lot of like pop, pop producers uh, that are really, really talented and can really craft a pop song, yeah. you know? And I really envy that. That's a, that's a skill that I really, I look up to these people as well. Like, I think it's really, it, it's a cra it's craftsmanship, you know, to make something that's really has a hook and, and really becomes an earworm and, and uh, you know, well-produced and all that stuff. So I would have loved to do, do that. But the fact is I couldn't do it with the same passion and the same, like, if I don't write a hit song, I don't have, you know, I can't pay my rent sort of <laughs> um, yeah. motivation, you know, that others might have. I was already sort of comfortable, you know, just making, not just, but, you know, I, I had a career already. Uh, yeah, you in, didn't want to give all that up for the sake in, of it, in, yeah. Yeah, in making games uh, and, and music for games and, and so on. So, so and I had a plan, you know, with with GTFO and, and 10 Chambers and so on. So, so that was... It, it never came to fruition in any in any way. So that's uh, a thousand pounds in the trash, I oh guess. Oh God, yeah. Oh, ouch. <laughs> but you did release a couple of albums anyway, because there was Radix. I remember seeing you. Yeah, that's that's the music like from that. Robonauts. That's the oh, music I okay. talked to er, uh, about okay. earlier. So that's uh, I, I I whenever I make the music uh, as a, as a freelancer, I offer them. You know, if you want to own all the music and and put out the soundtrack, then you can do that. But I will give you a gift discount if you let me retain the rights to release the soundtrack, and then they can use the music in the game and in the marketing for the game. But uh. they can't release the music as a standalone piece of uh, product. You know, like on Spotify or iTunes or whatnot and if they if they let me keep that right to do that then i will give them uh, a discount and they wanted they 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 uh, went for that you know the company that made um cubic games or something i thought they were called polish uh, game developer so i retained the rights the rights to 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 put that music on Spotify and I put it out. But I didn't own the, the Robonauts logo or anything. You know, I didn't ask them to, to make a, an album uh. cover. So that's why I'm sort of like, it's called like music from and inspired by Robonauts. All oh, right, okay. But the, the title of the, the album is, is Radix. So is that similar to what hap what's happened now? Because I know you, you said, I think it was it towards the end of last year about you getting some of the rights to publish from the Payday 2 music on Spotify. Is that a similar situation with that or no that's that's a couple of tracks that i made in my spare time and several years after i had left uh, uh starbreeze i i went to 
Mikael Nermark, who who's the C, who was the C, CEO after Bo left, and told him like, I would like to have this on paper that I own these tracks because I did, didn't really make them on office hours. You know, ah, it, okay. it, it was uh, someone came to me like, we need something for this microsite or we need something for a marketing campaign or we need something tomorrow. And like it's first of April and we have this first of, oh. you know, April fool's joke, you know, yeah. and I was like, I pulled something from my hard drive at home and sort of like uh, use this, you know, <laughs> how's this <laughs> and, Enjoy. They, and they put it in <laughs> and I didn't think more about that. And then, uh, yeah, and, and Mikel was really uh, not forth forthcoming. Like he was really um, like accepted. Uh, yeah, he, he, he wasn't looking for like. Oh, do you have proof that you you wrote it in your spare time? You know, but the fact is, and I can honestly say that I did write it in my spare time. You know, so it was. A, it's a handful of tracks that I own, uh, and I have a contract with Starbreeze that I do own them. You know, and I feel mm. like uh, I gotta make something with that. So uh, it's gonna be released on uh, on Spotify. But I want to make the most of that because I know that. People are really looking for, you know, the payday fans are are really starved for for ha having the music on, <laughs> on the streaming services and and yeah. on iTunes and, and so on and so forth. So I've contacted a number of very talented and uh, some very successful producers and and artists actually to contribute to it. You know, so they're making their own like reinterpretations or remixes of my tracks uh oh, wow. so i'm gonna put that out as well so it's gonna be like not just those tracks but actually like a whole like uh, i probably i'll put it out like bit by bit like this here's here's breath of death and here's all the remixes or reinterpretations of breath of death and then that's an ep or sort of a single and then ah, a couple of months okay, later yeah. I'll, I'll put something else out we'll see if i m make it so that all of it is out by the end of two 2021 i'm not sure it's a lot of work uh like yeah I can imagine. putting together all of this and and being in contact with the, the artists and, and get, getting them you know the the, the midi data and this all the stems from the music and giving them the time to do this you know in their but busy schedules you know and they have other projects that might pay more uh obviously i'm paying them you know but i'm pulling some favors uh as well you know uh and uh it's it's gonna be it's really something to look forward to because it's it's gonna be cool f for people to be like oh th this is gonna be fun to hear that artist interpret simon's track you know so uh yeah that's really something for the payday fans to look forward to that sounds fantastic because i know when you first announced it on twitter there was a real big kind of like excitement excited reaction to that so it is good because yeah, because there are there are some tracks on Spotify. I can't remember quite how many there are, but there's not like it's not exactly a comprehensive collection of all the tracks. You know, it's a lot of the the earlier days stuff. I think like the first couple of years of Payday Two. No, it's I don't it, quite it's, know it's it, only is. the 15 tracks that are on Spotify are the ones that were in the game when they was released back in 2013. Oh God, it's even less than I thought. Then there you so go. So it's the vanilla mm -hmm. Payday Two music, really. That's all there is. Okay. And my ambition when I still worked at, at Starbeast was to to continue releasing like, or here here's the next 15 tracks, that's volume two. And then the next 15 ah. tracks, volume three, and then the next 15 tracks, volume four. And actually, you know, pr have it professionally mastered so that it actually sounds good in comparison to other tracks that are, are on the platform, you know, Spotify, because it's all mastered for the game, but it needs to be mastered for actually listened to like, because uh, if you put it in a playlist, it's going to sound rubbish. You know, you, you yeah. listen to a, a payday track and then afterwards comes a, a Chemical Brothers track and it's going to sound so much better. Uh, obviously, <laughs> Chemical Brothers, it's always going to sound better, but at least on a mastering, <laughs> like a mastering level, it's not going to sound like my, my track is weaker, you know. So I wanted to do that. But uh, when I left Starbreeze, I don't think that anyone else like had really had the passion or the, had the... To, to carry on you know with that sort of project so that i think that's why no one you know starbies ha has the rights to what's the word what's the expression the lion's part the lion's share the lion's share of the um of the of the soundtrack obviously they own you know 95 percent, 98 percent of it you know i only own like a, a handful of tracks uh -huh. so it's up to them really but I, I, I can't really speak for them i don't know why it's taking so long or if they even have the uh intention of of releasing it you know mm, i wonder 
I'm inter- interesting to, to know that I didn't quite understand the situation behind that, so that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Um, but but kudos, way, just what the- I want to say is kudos to, to, to Mika and Neymar for, for just trusting me and believing me when I said this, this, these tracks are written on my spare time and, and uh, I, I want a, a contract. And they actually took the, you know, they had to pay money to get one, a lawyer and I had to pay money to get a lawyer. And then those lawyers sort of came up with a wording <laughs> for a contract that, that made me happy and made Starbreeze happy. So it cost them money and it cost me money to get that contract in place. But yeah, so I'm, I'm super happy about that, that they were really like uh, uh, happy to, to, to help out with that stuff. That, that was amazing. That's brilliant. I'm looking forward to that. So I don't suppose you've got any idea as to where maybe the first one might release then. You said like it's all very much in the air still. Yeah, I, I got... I'm pushing my luck here, I know, but I just thought I'd ask just in case, in case you can tease anything. Uh, no, I don't have any... I, I don't dare no, have any... Uh, say any dates or anything. It's it's just going to be, you know, promises that I'll be breaking, probably, you know. No, that's totally understandable. Either way, I'm, I'm glad, because I, I, I'm glad that I understand a bit more about it now, because I didn't understand the whole background as to, you know what was happening and how it, how it's going so they, it sounds really really cool the way you're working out so I'm looking yeah. forward to it I can say I can say this though and I haven't mentioned this publicly so this is news to to, to the world <gasps> oh we got a scoop cool <laughs> uh, I will be making a vinyl release with that stuff on it so that there's a I know Ooh. that you know the, the as I said the payday fans have been that they're starved for for the music digitally but even more so, I'd say, starved for something physical to own. For fans of the soundtrack, you know, there's going to be a vinyl yeah. uh, release uh, with some uh, at least uh, time exclusive stuff on it. Oh wow, that's fantastic! That's got me interested as well. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm starting to get into vinyl collecting a lot over the last year or two. I've been really getting yeah. into that, so that's got that's, me excited as well. I, I'll, 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 I'm really putting you know a lot of effort into it to make it like something that that's worth you know getting uh, yeah. and I've re- I even looked into a vinyl pressing plant that is actually in Sweden that I can travel to so I will go and sign every copy personally oh, wow. um, before they're shrink wrapped so that it's actually like it'll be coll- a collectible item for sure that sounds fantastic very limited like 300 fantastic. 300 maybe 500 copies or something like that if you want to give me the heads up to make sure I get one, I'd really appreciate that. Um, no, no, that sounds fantastic. I'm really glad to hear that. I will definitely be picking them up. That's brilliant. And that's a nice touch as well, signing them as well. I think that'll definitely make it a lot more, you know, exciting as a collector's piece, you know, to have your signature on it as, as, on top of everything else that's being offered just in the music itself. That'll be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, that kind of pretty much answers the last question I had, which was going to be, you know, what's what's next for you, what are the projects you're working on? So besides carrying on with Tame, 10 Chambers and GTFO and these now Spotify and vinyl releases, is there anything else coming up for you that, that you that you want to talk about? Or I think that pretty much sums it up, really. I mean, that's exciting in itself, both of those things. Just yeah. Yeah, it's it's GTFO, and it, we keep updating that game, you know, with new stuff all the time. Um, mm. And then uh, on my spare time, when I'm not taking care of my two kids <laughs> and uh, my <laughs> lovely wife, obviously, uh, then I'm trying to squeeze in, you know, all the work on that that uh, digital slash vinyl release. Yeah, oh, I can imagine. It's going to be really exciting when that comes out, and... I'll be excited to myself get the little scoop out now. I'm glad you gave me a little something I can put out. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, those are all the questions that I have for you, Simon. So what I always tend to do with these episodes at the very end is if there are any social medias, anything like that that you'd like to plug, now's your chance. Share anything and all, any, everything about you for people to follow you on and keep up to date with your work. Well, I, I have an Instagram. I have a Facebook page. But I, uh, to be honest, I don't really put, put it, a lot of effort into updating them. So my platform of choice where you should follow me if you're interested in in getting news about whatever i'm doing or just hearing my shower thoughts (laughs) that i sometimes (laughs) write down in a tweet um you should follow me on twitter so twitter is my and it's simon vicklin just s-i-m-o-n-v-i-k-l-u-n-d in one word simon vicklin uh is my handle well thank you very much simon it has been an absolute pleasure i'm really glad we had the chance to sit down and have this conversation because there were so many things i wanted to know you know behind the scenes about how everything worked and i've had a really good time getting to know a bit more about you yeah thanks for having me it's been an absolute blast thank you very much likewise absolute blast (laughs) 